From Miami Law, I'm Annette Ugez, and this is The Explainer. An illicit excavation is a plague. It destroys the archaeological record. Looters don't care about uh, uh, segregating out different strata. They also don't care about uh, what archaeologists do, which is every piece of material remain. They are looking for a saleable object. News that the FBI is seeking help from governments from the Indo-Pacific region to the Americas to assist in the return of more than 40,000 cultural artifacts seized in a raid in Indiana four years ago surfaced recently, as well as stories about the return to Egypt of a first-century gilded coffin acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2017. Here with the law behind the movement of artifacts across borders is international art and museum law expert and co-author of the law casebook, Law, Ethics, and the Visual Arts, Stephen Urice. Let's go to executive producer Catherine Skip with the interview. Good morning, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. With these two recent revelations, the the Metropolitan Museum of Art returning the gilded coffin to Egypt and the FBI starting to look for ways to return these thousands of uh, artifacts that were seized in the 2014 raid in Indiana. Can you kind of educate us on how these events fit into a larger conversation about art and museum law? Sure. Let's start with the uh, Metropolitan Museum and the uh, situation with the gilded coffin of Nejmonk. The In the acquisition of works of art, there are only two fundamental legal questions. The first is, can a purchaser acquire good title to the piece? And second, is the purchaser acquiring acquiring an authentic piece? So good title and authenticity are the two key legal issues in the acquisition of a work of art. Now, with many works of art that are known and documented, that is a slightly easier uh, procedure to uh, exercise diligence uh, with unprovenanced, as we call them, antiquities. That is to say, antiquities whose first known history of ownership is their appearance on the market. Then there's a more difficult um, set of analyses that has to move forward for a purchaser to assure himself, herself, or itself, in the case of the Met, um, that the purchaser can acquire a good title and is acquiring an authentic piece. Uh, this is particularly true of antiquities uh, that suddenly appear in the marketplace. We know that not only are works of art forged, but documents are forged. And that seems to have been the situation here. So let's look at what probably happened. Um, the work was said when the Metropolitan bought it to have left Egypt in 1971. That's important because the standard, the ethical standard for acquiring uh, antiquities as promulgated by the Association of Art Museum Directors, of which the director of the Met is a member, um, uses the date of the UNESCO Convention of 1970, that's November 17, 1970, as the cutoff date for um, stricter diligence a work that is known to have left its country of modern discovery before that date is under less scrutiny than works that left after that date. So knowing that the Met had been told that this piece left Egypt after 1970 meant that it it should have gone into a higher gear of diligence to demonstrate it could obtain good title Mm -hmm. as well as that the work was authentic. Now here, there seems to be no issue about the authenticity of the work The question is, who owns it? Mm -hmm. Now, Egypt has had, uh, since 1983, and before that, a whole series of statutes that go back to the 19th century that we refer to as patrimony statutes. These statutes tend to do three things. First is they regulate excavation in a country. Second, they usually purport to vest title to all antiquities in the country And that varies. Sometimes it's simply undiscovered antiquities, antiquities that are still underground or unknown. Sometimes it's all antiquities, even if in private ownership. So these patrimony statutes uh, generally assert that the nation, the country, has 
title to all antiquities. In, in Egypt, the statute refers to um, all unknown antiquities, all antiquities that have not uh, previously been discovered. The third thing that these patrimony statutes do is um, enact, they enact certain export requirements. And typically in antiquities rich countries, that third element says that a work is illicitly exported if it is not exported with a uh, valid export uh, permit. Now, in a landmark case in 2003, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, in a case against a, an antiquities dealer, Frederick Schultz, held that where a foreign country has enacted a patrimony statute that vests title to antiquities in the country, where that statute is also enforced locally within the country's borders, under those circumstances, an antiquity that is illicitly exported from that country is deemed to be a stolen work of art. Mm -hmm. And that's obvious. If the country says it's ours, we have good title to it in a properly enacted statute, it's a real statute, they enact it locally, then taking it out of the country without an export license is tantamount to theft. In 2003, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals held that was indeed the case for purposes of the United States Federal National Stolen Property Act. Mm -hmm. The NSPA says that uh, the transport across uh, state lines or U.S. borders, the possession, the transfer of works that the possessor knows to have been stolen is a federal crime. Mm -hmm. So let's put this together. Under the 2003 ruling, if a work of art has been illicitly excavated, illicitly exported from Egypt, then that work, if it is in the possession of somebody in the United States, is a violation of US law, mm -hmm. not Egyptian law, but US law, the National Soul and Property Act. So what appears to have happened in this case is the Metropolitan Museum was given false documents indicating a provenance of a piece that turned out not to be accurate. The piece appears to have been illicitly excavated fairly recently. Um, its first appearance was on the market. We don't know anything more than that before that time. And, um, uh, and therefore, it comes within this, this group of objects that the Schultz, course, the Schultz Court the Second Circuit, said are stolen works mm -hmm. for purposes of the National Stolen Property Act. Possession of a work known to have been stolen uh, that has crossed a U.S. border and has a certain value is a federal crime. So if the Met says, oops, we messed up, is the only fallout to the Met returning the work? Or is there some, you know, monetary penalty or anything else assessed there's, against the okay, map? There's a variety of um, of remedies if a possessor of a work within the ambit of the National Stolen Property Act is found to be guilty. In the case of Fred Schultz, he went to jail. Um, the works also are subject to either civil or criminal forfeiture. What the Met appears to have done here is it was informed of irregularities in the history of ownership there was sufficient documentation presented to the Met to demonstrate that the work was illicitly um, excavated recently and illicitly exported from Egypt after the enactment of the 83 statute, and therefore being in possession of stolen property, knowing the property then to be stolen, it did the right thing, which is to return it to its proper owner, Egypt. Mm -hmm. Good. It really had no other choice. It's a, uh, it's a, Museum of great standing, and once it uh, realized that it was in possession of stolen work, it had to return it. There was no other alternative. Why didn't they know before before they brought it in that it was maybe a product of the Arab Spring looting or or something along those there's lines? There's been there's been an enormous amount of looting in Egypt in recent years. That should have heightened concerns. 
the documentation they had that it left the uh, country of origin, Egypt, of modern discovery, Egypt, in 1971, not before 1970, um, meant that it should have exercised a higher level of scrutiny, of diligence in determining um, where the piece came from, uh, how it was found, who owned it, and so on. Um, the Association of Art Museum Directors uh, has a set of guidelines for the acquisition of archaeological material or ancient works of art. It was first promulgated in 2004. They were revised in 2008 and again in 2013. And the 2008 amendment, which carried forward in the 2013 amendments, um, requires that or permits a museum to acquire work that had not left its country of modern discovery prior to 19, November 17, 1970, under certain precise circumstances, one of which is a heightened degree of diligence in determining the, the work's origins and history of ownership. So it appears that the Met was misled by false documentation into believing that this piece could be, a good title to the piece could be obtained, and um, that was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Also, the AMD um, guidelines require that any object that was not known to have left its country of modern discovery before 1970 and is acquired by the museum, even after exercising diligence, must then be published on an online objects registry maintained by the American Association of Museum, I'm sorry, the uh, Association of Art Museum Directors, AMD, website. To the best of my knowledge, uh, it's not posted there now, whether it was taken down after the return uh, to Egypt uh, or to Egyptian authorities, I don't know. Um, but uh, the Met was under an obligation under the AMD guidelines to post this piece on the objects registry, and I'm not sure if it was done or not. Mm -hmm. The piece is not uh, up there now. Mm -hmm. well, this feels like a good place to talk about the the Getty mm -hmm. and the victorious youth, the statue of victorious youth. Is that the correct name? That of it? is. It's it's uh, often just shortened to the Getty Bronze. The Getty Bronze. And um, so there's a museum that's holding a piece that the Italian government seems to think is theirs. And you recently wrote an op-ed in the, the New York Times about it. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. There's enormous difference between the Getty Bronze and the uh, coffin of Nejibank. Um The Getty Bronze was found in 1968 by fishermen. Um, there is a 1973 um, decision by Italy's highest court, the Court of Cassation, in which the uh, Italy's highest court uh, held that there was no evidence that this piece had been found in Italian waters and therefore could not form part of Italy's cultural patrimony, making the piece subject to its patrimony statute. No question that the piece had been brought ashore into Italy and then was illicitly exported from Italy um, into Switzerland or into Germany, and certainly into Germany because that's where it was uh, put up for sale. And the difference is that the Getty Bronze, uh, at the time the Mr. Getty, who was still alive, purchased the piece in the 1970s, um, had the authority of Italy's highest court, which held that the piece was not owned by Italy and not part of Italy's cultural patrimony. And now Italy's saying, King's X, we want another right. bite at this. And so the same Court of Cassation now, 50 years later, um, a local prosecutor uh, in Pissarro, uh, near where the piece was brought ashore, began a rather quixotic legal journey to try to assert that indeed the piece was found in Italian waters, did form part of the Italian cultural heritage, was subject to Italian patrimony statutes. Uh, what's really curious about this is that 50 years later, we don't know what new facts, what new evidence was presented. The uh, new decision that came down in uh, December of last year, um, I've not yet seen a translation of the court decision. Mm -hmm. So we don't know yet, at least I don't know yet, um, 
on what new evidence the uh, Italy's Supreme Court reversed itself. Even with that evidence, one would have to look at that evidence with real doubt um, because we have a Supreme Court holding 50 years ago, this is not Italy's uh, property, and now reversing itself. Um, statutes of limitations, the doctrine of repose, both exist for very good reason, which is to settle the affairs of individuals in the marketplace, to avoid a court having to deal with stale evidence, uh, missing witnesses, bad memories. Um, repose and statutes of limitations work to limit the time of liability mm -hmm. for a wrong, uh, for judicial efficiency and for fairness. So to reopen this 50 years later, um, and to assert that this piece is now part of Italy's cultural patrimony and therefore should be returned to Italy is highly unusual, completely different than the case of Nejimonk, where a piece came onto the marketplace in France. Its first known ownership, uh, history of ownership was its appearance in the marketplace. That is a bright red flag to anybody acquiring a work of art in antiquity or otherwise that a very high level of diligence must be exercised in acquiring that work. Mm. Very different than the situation with the Getty Bronze, which was well-known, well-published, well-documented as having uh, been found in international waters and as having been put up for sale in Europe. Great. So now let's talk about the 91-year-old missionary in Indiana with the 20,000 pieces of artifacts. So this is, this is a highly unusual case of an individual having in his possession this kind of eclectic collection um, of human remains and artifacts. And this is a very difficult situation because each of these objects has to be identified and classified before it can be determined whether the object uh, is properly in the possession of the current uh, alleged owner. Now, we should segregate out objects from human remains mm -hmm. because different uh, issues are implicated. Um, under the Native Americans Grave Repatriation and Protection Act, referred to by the acronym uh, NAGPRA. Um, Rolls off the tongue. <laughs> right off the tongue, right. And um, under NAGPRA, um, NAGPRA requires um, the uh, repatriation to Native Americans of objects in museum collections um, if the museums have received federal funds. Now, when NAGPRA was enacted in 1990, it created a real uh, concern in museum circles that their, uh, particularly their study collections of Native American goods and of human remains would be decimated, bringing an end to scientific study of these remains. In fact, for museums that have complied with NAGPRA's um, uh, uh, demand that these museums create inventories of these materials, match them up with um, current tribes that may be uh, the descendants of the original owners of these pieces, mm -hmm. and to enter into negotiations to repatriate this property, um, in fact, the experience has been very good that uh, tribe, tribes and certain museums that have cooperated have moved forward in a remarkable way, um, creating alliances that had never before existed. Now, of course, the repatriations has meant that the museums have lost their collections of human remains and grave goods in particular. But... Um, those pieces have then been returned to um, the Native American tribes that today are the descendants of those from whom those objects were uh, either taken or otherwise acquired. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole set of objects that may um, purport to be, that may be within the range of what NAGPRA would uh, cover in a museum, but still um, would be put under strict scrutiny. Now, under separate law, the taking of Native American um, relics from federal lands is a federal offense. 
And in fact, the United States has only one export restriction on cultural property of which I'm aware. Um, if the Metropolitan Museum tomorrow decided to sell its collection and export it to, to China or to the Middle East, wherever the art market is moving, um, technically it could do so because we have no export restrictions on cultural property in the United States except for Native American material that has been found on federal lands. So if this individual is in possession of Native American objects or remains that had derived from federal lands, um, then there is a real cause for concern. Um, well, add, he's dead. Sorry? He's dead. Right, um, which, which is an interesting <laughs> question then. Um, there was a wonderful case a number of years ago about a, of a Texas collector um, who died owning looted works from a German cathedral. And after the works were eventually uh, returned to Germany, the real penalty that hit the family was the IRS. They came in and said he was in possession of these works at the time of his death. Their value needed to be included in his estate for state tax purposes. And they assessed fines and penalties, which effectively were wiped out uh, his family. But um, so that may be an issue here. I don't know uh, the timing on it. But um, so as to the Native um, American remains, those must be treated with respect, deference. Um, these are human remains. And tribal groups, um, from what I understand, have been included by the FBI in its analysis and in its treatment of these remains um, as they've been inventorying them. Now, works from other countries, pre-Columbian works, for example, uh, virtually all, that I know, all Latin American countries that, and South American countries that would be in, uh, that would be sources of um, pre-conquest materials have enacted the kind of patrimony statutes I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, that regulate excavations, prohibit illicit excavations, vest title in the country to antiquities, and prohibits export without a license. Um, and so the question then is, where did these objects come from? Did they leave the country of origin before or after enactment of the patrimony statute? If before, then they may perhaps... Um, Good title may, in fact, have vested in the collector. It would depend upon other factors. Um, but it's going to be very difficult with most of these pieces to determine when they left their countries of origin. And also what the country of origin is, is going to be difficult because Mayan, Incan, and other um, pre-colonial um, materials are found in a variety of contemporary nation states today. Mm -hmm. So where these objects came from will need to be determined before we can analyze what law applies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I assume that's the reason the FBI is reaching out to other countries and go help help us figure this out. It, it's an interesting case. Um, are these kinds of, all these things that we're talking about today, are, are these on the rise, not on the rise? Does technology have... Uh, you know, uh, play a part in this that didn't, let's say, 20 years ago? Well, it's a really good question. Um, one of the shifts in the art market has been from the traditional sources of ancient material and antiquities, which for generations have been one of two sources. That is art dealers who deal in goods of that kind and public auction. With the advent of online marketplaces, there's been an explosion in the number of objects, typically of lower value and less significance, um, available on the internet. Um, and there are there's clear evidence that a great deal of that material is not authentic. And as to the authentic pieces, that there's no real history of ownership, meaning that they're very likely to have been recently um, looted illicitly excavated. And illicit excavation is a plague. It destroys the archeological record. Looters don't care about uh, 
uh, segregating out different strata. They also don't care about uh, what archaeologists do, which is every piece of material remain. They are looking for a saleable object. So looting is damaging not only to objects, but also to the archaeological record and the ability of an ancient site to be scientifically excavated after it's been looted. Um, it's indescribably um, damaging. Mm -hmm. And so with the advent of online marketplaces, yes, there appears to have been a broadening of the number of people who collect these materials and a much easier way to get them into the marketplace than had been the case when there were simply traditional art dealers and public auctions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for the good guys, there's much more technology available to assess those. Ah, uh, let's say the good guys. Um, there are good dealers. Um, no, I mean, but I mean, people who would, like, <laughs> yeah, right? that are able that are, to that take are ethical. something. But right. if, if, you, uh, if what you're saying, though, I think is that technology now permits um, a much greater degree of surveillance of the degree and activity and location of uh, illicit excavations of looting. Absolutely mm -hmm. the case. And also being able to determine more information about the looted object scientifically by carbon testing or well, things know, along that line. Um, right. Carbon dating has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, soil analysis has been around for a long time. Um, so there may be new forensics, in fact, coming on to, uh, into investigators' hands. Um, but oftentimes, it's really, um, it still remains, in determining authenticity and origin, authenticity is predicated on, it's a stool that has three legs, one of which is history of ownership, provenance. Uh, the second is forensics. What scientific evidence do we have about the object? And then the third leg, which is connoisseurship, the ability to discern whether an object is good, as we call it, authentic, um, or whether it is not, and identifying its place uh, among a group of similar pieces to try to determine um, its fine spot. So um, in a way, yes, even as science advances in these areas, a great deal of it still remains a matter of art, which is the simple act. It's not simple. The very complex act of looking at an object with an eye that has looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of objects, a discerning eye that can bring information to the table about the object, that history, lacking history of ownership or questionable forensics may not be able to give us. Good. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This was fun. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks for joining us at The Explainer. If you like the show, leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform and tell your friends to subscribe. You can always drop us a comment at explainer at miami.edu. Our show is engineered and edited by Christopher Alzadi with theme music composed by Ray D. Kim from the Frost School of Music. I'm your host, Annette Uguez. Today's show was brought to you by Miami Law's new two-week summer legal English and skills program for foreign attorneys looking to improve their legal English language and lawyering skills, July 15th through the 26th. For more information, go to law.miami.edu forward slash global dash summer dash academy. Thank you.